<laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Brett Thomas. Uh, I am uh, the co-founder, CTO, and CSO of Vindicia, uh, and we do subscription billing for internet merchants. Um, but uh, we're a we're a PCI level one compliant. We've been that way for ten years now. Uh, so security is something I spend a lot of my time on. Uh, but long before that, I was a foot soldier in the Great Crypto War. I put it that way because while I was there, my role was small. I'm probably not one of the people you've ever heard of, uh, though I knew a lot of them. I directly worked with people like Phil Zimmerman, Colin Plum, John Callis, uh, and Hal Finney, may he slumber in peace. My role was small, but I thought a lot about what happened and what it means to us today. I also collected some stories that I hope you'll find entertaining. Uh, I went to work at PGP in November of 1996 when I was 26. Prior to that, I'd always done boring corporate software development. I was lucky enough to be working on a check processing software at NCR with a fellow whose aunt was the VP of Engineering at PGP Incorporated right after they formed. And he said, hey, you're into that crypto stuff, right? And now I'm a security expert. Phil Zimmerman began work on PGP in 1991. In those days, there was no widely available freeware public key encryption. This, of course, was about the same time that the web was invented, and it, but it predated Netscape and automatic key exchange and security vulnerabilities caused by automatic key exchanges. I know it's popular to hate, to hate on PGP for its usability now. I do think it's good to remember that we were literally the first people to try to figure out how to do this for a broad audience. Back in those days, which will sound familiar still today, there was serious talk in Washington about banning the private use of cryptography altogether. Back before widespread online banking, it was generally safe to assume that if you were encrypting things, that you almost certainly had to be up to something. Of course, some people still assume that. Phil's goal at the time was to produce a public key crypto system that would be freely available. Even if, he thought, they do ban it, once it's out there, people can continue to use it. It was posted to the internet quickly. While they hadn't yet managed to outlaw possession of cryptography, it was illegal under ITAR to export strong cryptography. You may recall there being an export version of Netscape that didn't have good crypto. Strong was considered to be greater than 56 bits key length uh, for symmetric encryption that may give you some idea of uh, the, 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 how ridiculous this was. Um, ITAR is the International Traffic in Arms Regulations. So that's the same set of laws that makes it illegal to export nuclear weapons or poison gas. I think the theory here was that the brilliant minds in America would invent cryptography so wonderful that our enemies would only be able to, uh, to get them from us. Certainly, Russians aren't known for their love and knowledge of math. <laughs> Posting something to the internet, even back then, had the net effect of exporting it. And the Department of Commerce opened an investigation on Phil for having violated the ITAR. Phil claimed to have no idea who could have posted it to the internet. I also personally don't know who it was, for the record. Uh, the investi this investigation shadowed Phil for several years, but in 1996, the government finally dropped the investigation. With his cloud lifted, he, is, he of course immediately left Boulder, Colorado for Silicon Valley so that he could build a company and get rich. Recognizing he didn't have a head for business, he hired a bunch of professional managers and salespeople and let, and let them make the business decisions, candidly describing himself as the face on the bucket of chicken. <laughs> I started at PGP in November of 1996 and was employee number 24. I'd only ever worked in huge corporations before, and so it was wonderfully liberating to suddenly be at a place where my work actually mattered and was noticed. When you work in a big company, you can, do, you can afford to do anything you want, but no one will let you. When you work in a small company, you can do anything you want, but you can't afford it. <laughs> Personally speaking, I find that latter restriction to be less restrictive, and so I swore that I was never going to work for a big company again. Unfortunately, that initial crew wasn't actually all that much better at, the business, at that business than Phil was, and at the end of 1997, we sold the company to McAfee. I did not get rich. I made almost exactly the amount that I needed to do the 60,000 mile maintenance on my Ford Taurus SHO. In the short intervening years, though, the U.S. had changed on crypto. Before I tell that history, though, 
I want to take a small diversion and tell you about the first Easter egg I ever coded. As I said, prior to PGP, I'd only worked on boring corporate stuff. When you're writing software that reads microdata off checks, you don't really have a lot of opportunity to do fun stuff like Easter eggs. PGP was, in fact, my very first consumer product. Some might say by the results, that was obvious. However, I resolved to do something fun with it in my copious spare startup time. In our initial corporate release, PGP 5.0, I was tasked with writing a tool that would sit in the Windows taskbar and provide easy encrypting and decrypting of text on the Windows clipboard. Then use uh, uh, the idea being that if we hadn't pre-integrated with your email program, you would simply copy encrypted text to the clipboard, then use the taskbar encryption device to decrypt it. I don't recall who named it the taskbar encryption device. Given how terrible a name it is, I probably did. <laughs> Regardless, I and everyone else began referring to it internally as TED. This was before the talks. At some point, I was asked during a meeting what TED stood for. And I replied, probably having not gotten any sleep the night before, totally encrypted, dude. <laughs> this became the idea for my Easter egg. I recorded myself saying something like, TED stands for either taskbar encryption device, or totally encrypted, dude. I then knew you encoded the WAV file of my voice, embedded it in the source files, and had it play from your speakers if you completed some secret set of keyboard clicks or mouse movements or something. I don't remember. As far as I know, no one ever found it. <laughs> one initiative I spearheaded was that of getting the internet key server support into the product. Mark Horowitz at MIT had just come out with his first experimental key server. Key exchange had long been recognized as one of the hardest parts of PGP, and I felt very strongly that if we could make it easy to find and download someone's key, it would be very helpful in our mission to make PGP more usable. However, we were trying to ship our first product, and management felt the feature wasn't important enough to risk it on. So I ended up marshalling a skunk words effort to slip it in without anyone in management finding out or getting on the schedule. I wrote example code for all of it and managed to convince all the major developers of the individual applications, the email plugins, the Netscape plugins, etc., to slip the code in, all of it surrounded by if defs so that it could be turned off at compile time if it ended up causing problems. As an aside, the key servers needed URLs, and I decided on HKP as the protocol name for Horowitz Key Protocol, which, to the extent that anyone actually uses PGP key servers, is my small contribution to the clutter that are URLs. I have a profile on a certain pretty good dating site that asks its users lots of questions. One of them is, what is the most private thing you're willing to admit? My answer is, I once caused a cert advisory. <laughs> After I completed my work on PGP 5.0 for Windows, I began to work on PGP 5.0 for Unix. While I've been a DOS, OS2, and Windows programmer for most of my admittedly short career, I have recently discovered Linux and was very much enthralled in the Unix way of doing things. Not long before I began work on that, Linux had added the dev random device. Those of you who used PGP long ago may recall the type on the keyboard to generate random data prop pauses during key generation. That code worked by simply taking the least significant digits of the milliseconds of the timing of your key presses and then use those to see the pseudo random number generator. Since that scene was unpredictable, it produced cryptographically random data, which is, of course, needed for secure key generation. I went and spoke to the expert at PGP about randomness, Colin Plum, and asked him if he knew if Linux's dev random was any good. He assured me that it was, in fact, it was, because in blatant violation of company policy, he'd been quietly consulting with Theodore So back channel to make sure it was good, and then if you looked, it used a lot of the same methods that the PGP random number generator did. I added dev random as a source of bits for our internal random generator. I didn't want to use it exclusively, not least because this was a cross-platform Unix version and most Unixes didn't yet support dev random out of the box. This is going to get a little bit technical, but I'd like to show exactly what went wrong here. Since I was using the existing random da data gathering code, I needed to fit into its framework. And it used the older style integer file descriptor numbers instead of newer file handle format. Since I was in those days a relatively new C programmer, I was a lot more familiar with the latter form. My initial proof of concept code, in fact, 
worked using file handles. But I decided to change it to use the file descriptors so I could eliminate some custom file management code and just use the same stuff the rest of the library was. One of my general philosophies about programming is that code that doesn't exist doesn't have bugs in it. And so I was very excited to remove whatever the latent bugs there might be in my five unique file handling code. But that resulted in me changing a call to the C function fguess to be a call to the C function read instead. And the resulting code looked like this. By the way, this is a great example of why you should not trust comments. Uh, their problem here is that call to read. Um, I will let you look at it for a moment and see if you can pick out the error, but you obviously have to be an old school C programmer. If you did that with fguts, fguts like this, it would be perfectly reasonable. Assuming you'd allocated Rambuff previously or count was always one. You'd then need to check Rambuff and make sure it wasn't null, but it would basically work. The problem is, that isn't what I wrote. What I wrote was, the problem is that read, unlike fgets, doesn't return a char star. It returns a size of. Of course, the PGP code was by that point fairly old and had been written originally by a double E, so it tended to emit lots and lots of compiler warnings, and I didn't, no and I didn't notice that I'd added a new one. Read, in fact, returns the number of bytes it read, which, the way the code was called, was always one. <laughs> Which meant that what this code did was, it read all the bytes out of your dev random pool, and for every character it read, it added the value 1 to your PGP random pool. Which, let's face it, really isn't very random. <laughs> and that is the story of how Cert Advisory 2000-09 was born. I think this is a great example of the maxim, don't write your own crypto. Obviously, that's a little difficult if writing crypto is your business, but obviously, <laughs> for the rest of us, getting this stuff right is hard. Even if you have some, sort, some of the best crypto people around reviewing your work, and you probably don't. One constant frustration for us was that we weren't able to export our code. This left us without an international clients, and also made it impossible for us to provide our product over the internet, which it was becoming obvious was going to be important. Of course, it was legal to import strong crypto, so our competition overseas could sell in the US. As one wag at the time put it, I'm unable to distribute soft security software online because I live in the US. Instead, I have to depend on the efforts of people in free countries like Russia, Germany, and Japan. <laughs> <laughs> or, as I like to say it, US policy was to export jobs, not crypto. <laughs> the early 90s was a time of government-mandated chips. The V-chip mandate, mandate required televisions to include the ability to filter content automatically. The NSA-designed Clipper chip would have mandated that any strong encryption for voice would also be encrypted to keys that the government retained. When younger visitors come to my house and see this poster by the brilliant Tom Tomorrow in my foyer, I have to explain to them that it's 20 years old. We literally have been fighting this idea for that long. This was, in fact, one of the first issues to galvanize the nascent EFF, who correctly tried to rebrand key escrow as key surrender. Thankfully, in 1994, Matt Blaze published protocol failure in the escrowed encryption standard. While it didn't allow for the decryption of messages from the Clipper-enabled devices, it could force a Clipper-enabled device to encrypt to a non-escrowed key. Whose autograph is that? Uh, that is actually John Gilmore's autograph. Uh, I, I got that at an EFF fundraiser in uh, 1997 or so. So, uh, Tainted by such issues, uh, Clipper thankfully was never mandated and never achieved widespread adoption, despite the government's incentives that they would, al that they would, allow, uh, that they would allow export of strong crypto that allowed for government escrows of keys. By the way, one other uh, side note on this poster, if you note, it very prominently displays the National Security Agency's logo. Um, it was, if you, I don't know if you can see it on the screen, but the very, very bottom right hand corner, it says copyright RSA Inc. Um, and uh, not long after I acquired that poster, uh, the NSA uh, sued RSA over their use of the NSA logo, even though it is fairly clearly fair use from a, from a uh, free speech perspective. Uh, and, R and as we now know, uh, RSA was actually pretty heavily in bed with them by that point. And uh, they actually did not fight the lawsuit and, and destroyed their existing stocks. So you cannot, uh, you can no longer, copies of that poster are hard to find. 
Um, one thing I did that caused some minor consternation at PGP was to become an international arms exporter. <laughs> About six months before I came to work at PGP, someone had set up a neat little civil disobedience project. There was a server in the US and a server in some, some place like Barbados, and he made a little web page that if you put in your name and email address on the US server and clicked a button, it would copy strong crypto from the US server to the foreign server, thus violating US export control law. Being 25 and ready to show the man just what I thought of him, when I saw this mentioned on Usenet, I jumped on it, typed in my name and email address, and exported the code. The system then automatically added my email address and name to the publicly, to the publicly published list of international arms exporters. <laughs> yes, this was back before spam. Someone at PGP, six months later, happened to stumble upon this thing. And it turned out I had been so on it when this was announced that I had in fact been the first person to export that program. <laughs> Which meant if you went to the list of international arms exporters maintained at this site, I was literally the first one at the very top of the list. Thankfully, there were never any practical ramifications of this, at least as so far as I learned. In 1995, David Bernstein wrote a paper on cryptography, including example source code. He then sued the US government for illegal prior restraint on his speech because, hey, you can't stop me from publishing a paper. The US government lost at the district level, and it was so obviously not going to win that they didn't even appeal. What they did do, however, was change the ITAR regulations to make it so that instead of saying, you can't export crypto, they said, you can't export machine-readable crypto. On one hand, this was widely mocked on the internet. Someone wrote a one-line Perl program that implemented RSA and then printed it out as barcodes. The barcodes they then printed on a t-shirt with the legend, this shirt is a munition and brave, civilly disobedient hackers wore them on airplanes on trips to Europe. Someone even got a tattoo of it, becoming a living weapon of mass destruction. <laughs> on the other hand, at PGP, someone saw that and thought, well, what does machine readable mean exactly? Obviously, the intent had been to prevent the distribution of binary code and probably any source code outside of textbook. But what did it really mean? Consequently, one Saturday, I find, found myself in the office helping Mark Weaver format the entirety of our source code for a book. We retained full license in it, and so no one else would be able to distribute it. We'd always intended to publish the source anyway, for peer review. Something I was personally grateful for when my cert advisory causing bug was found. Our formatting was a little novel, though. Each line of the text would be pretended by a CRC code for the line in question. And we printed it, it printed it using a font called Ogre B. You're probably familiar with it. Does anyone here remember checks? You know, bank account little pieces of paper? Uh, the numbers on the bottom are printed in Ogre B, which stands for Optical Character Recognition Font B. Oddly uh, enough, something that I had experience with in my check processing job back at NCR. The image here is from a later publication where we went to another font. It turned out that modern OCR has been optimized for more human-readable fonts and actually isn't very good at uh, reading over B anymore. Oh, and remember that Easter egg? An unexpected side effect of my new encoding my voice in the source code is that my voice is, in fact, published in a book, <laughs> which I can't imagine is something that very many people can say. We printed these up in a stack of books two feet high. That's only a subset. Uh, and assigned them an ISBN and distributed them through a bookstore in Palo Alto. I personally signed a number of copies we gave out at the monthly cypherpunks meeting in San Mateo. And someone in Europe bought a copy through the bookstore, cut the backs off with a big paper cutter, and scanned and OCR'd them, and two weeks later, PGP had been exported. The Department of Commerce opened an investigation, and Bob Cohn, PGP's chief counsel, went down to the, uh, their office with a big box. When the agent said, it appears that your code has been exported. Bob opened the box and dumped the books on his desk. Would you like me to sign it? They closed the investigation. <laughs> and they changed the regulations. Now, it was legal to export crypto, as long as you didn't do it to one of the seven deadlies on the state that has remained. 
Despite the NSA's backing of the Clipper chip, at BGP, we went through an effort to deprogram new hires from their hatred of the NSA. I arrived there in 1996 with a hatred of the NSA, born of their backing of the Clipper chip. It was explained to me that, when the DES standard was being adopted in the 1970s, the algorithm, originally developed by IBM, was reviewed by the NSA. One feature of DES is its use of substitution boxes, or S boxes. An S box is an algorithm that takes a given fixed input and turns it into another fixed output, and is used to make it harder to analyze original key inputs. The original DES spec was reviewed by NSA, and with no explanation, they rewrote the S box map. The paranoid in the open security community, which obviously is all of us, assumed that the NSA had adjusted the S-boxes to make their own cryptanalysis easier, thus making DES less secure. For many years, concerns about a secret NSA backdoor dodged dog, uh, uh, DES. Not long before I joined PGP, though, open security researchers discovered a powerful new technique called differential cryptanalysis. It resulted that DES's vulnerability to this attack depended on exactly how the transformations in the S-boxes worked, and that in fact, the original proposed X-boxes were quite vulnerable. The S-boxes as returned from the NSA without explanation were significantly stronger. Thus, we concluded at PGP that the NSA understood that, in their dual mission to secure Americans and read foreign communications, Ameri uh, Americans also needed, they recognized that Americans also needed strong security to keep others from intercepting our messages. New recruits were taught that while the NSA had a certain reputation in the public and in Washington, they obviously understood the value of securing communi American communications and were fundamentally on our side. By 1997, our victory was complete. The Clipper chip was dead on arrival. The NSA obviously cared more about securing American communications than they did about intercepting them. Congress was not in danger of passing widespread surveillance legislation. Export of strong crypto was not just possible, but the norm. Victory assured, we quit the field. There was never even a Treaty of Versailles. Our opponents had been so thoroughly defeated, they were now on our side. You may have guessed why I referred to this period as the Great Crypto War. When World War I was happening, they didn't know it was the First World War, so they referred to it as the Great War. Edward Snowden's revelations have made it clear that while we quit in victory, our opponents were still fighting. I was actually in Crypto War I. Now, on schedule, we find ourselves in Crypto War II, trying to hold territory that we thought we'd conquered already. I thought a long time about what happened. I really did think the NSA had been won over, or maybe even was on our side the whole time. How was I wrong? I thought of three factors. 9-11 changed everything. While they used to recognize that securing the U.S. against foreign powers was a part of their mandate, 9-11 caused them to refocus solely and entirely upon terrorism. Prevent another 9-11 trumped all other concerns, including keep U.S. data from China, much less pay attention to the rule of law. Two, they mess with people. That's what they do. It's their jobs. They mess with us, and we bought it. Three, the NSA isn't monolithic. Like any large organization, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. I suspect all of these items have some truth, but many years of experience with large organizations have caused me to put a lot of weight on the third one. The NSA is paying people to strengthen security standards at the same time as it is paying people to weaken them. I strongly suspect, even, that the NSA has paid people to strengthen a security standard, and at the same time it has paid other people to weaken it. This makes evaluating any given contribution they make very difficult. We, know that, we now know that they helped with DES, but we also know that they actively undermined elliptic curve key generation in a 2012 NIST standard. You can neither blindly conclude that anything they say is evil, nor that it's helpful. We find ourselves again locked in combat with those who would undermine our security and privacy. We got some good news yesterday when the current administration was, the, 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 it announced that they are not going to try to force a, a legislative solution yet. But that doesn't mean we don't, we don't need to keep fighting this idea. We seem to be making progress with the intelligence communities, perhaps motivated by some recent high-profile hackings. Law enforcement would still like to have easy access to everything that they want. If we stand together and actively oppose these measures, we will yet again triumph over those who would trample our privacy, our security, and our fundamental human rights. Thank you.